Welcome to the Dental Implant Practices Podcast, where each episode will explore how to integrate dental implants into your practice and into bone with your host, Dr. Philip Gordon. Hey guys, thanks for being listeners of the show. Go to dentalimplantpractices.com and find all of our resources. Also find us on Facebook, Dental Implant Practices page on Facebook. And go to iTunes and leave me a review on iTunes so we can help spread the message. Thanks. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Dental Implant Practices podcast. I'm your host, Philip Gordon. And today, um, I'm actually going to not be interviewing anybody. It's just going to be me doing a short piece on socket preservation grafting. So I've been getting a lot of questions and people interested in how to bone graft and how to do socket preservation grafts and how to prepare for implant placement. And so I thought, you know, What better than to do maybe a full episode on socket preservation grafts for implant site development. So that's what we're going to cover today. You know, anytime anyone wants to get into implant dentistry, I like to always ask, how are your surgery skills? How comfortable are you extracting teeth and suturing? Because I feel like that's the foundation for any implantology is uh, a good foundation in tooth extraction, you know, maybe bone grafting, flap design and suture placement. So today we're going to be covering the basics in those so that even if you're not placing implants in your site, you can hopefully successfully extract every tooth in the mouth pain-free, elevate flaps, place bone, put down membranes, preserve those spaces, and after maybe a year of that, you have a hundred sites in your office that are ready to go. And as you learn to get better and better with your implantology training, you'll have those sites ready to go. So let's get the uh, episode started here. So What I want to cover first is, you know, when it comes to extracting teeth in the general dentist office, you know, in school, I was just told to to take out teeth and pack in gauze and send the patient home. And now after practicing dentistry for eight years, I realized that's that's maybe the worst thing you can do. You know, patients are emphasizing now about um, reducing reducing bone loss, you know, keeping their, their jaw structure and patients want options now after teeth come out. So I when I when I discuss with a patient, you know, X, Y, Z tooth in the mouth has to come out, I automatically, for every tooth that comes out, uh, unless it's a second molar or third molar that we don't plan on doing an implant in, I always recommend a bone graft and a membrane and socket preservation. And for second molars, if the patient desires to to have implants placed, although that's not every patient, uh, obviously. So that conversation starts with the treatment plan, starts with, okay, we're going to take this tooth out. What desires do you have to replace a tooth? You know, is it um, going to be an implant placement? Is it going to be a future implant placement? Is it going to be an immediate implant placement? How are we going to temporize? Are we, do we need to temporize at all? Is it going to be a flipper, an Essex, a bonded Maryland bridge? You know, determining all those factors ahead of time with the patient, you know, ideal so that the preparation can begin so that, um, you know, you know what type of laboratory supplies you need. You know what type of uh, communication with the lab and the patient and the, and the times. And uh, beginning with the end in mind is always the best thing you can do for your patient. So getting all that groundwork covered and established, getting financials arranged is always where I like to start with that. And so what I found to be true over the years, you know, the most common teeth in the mouth that need to be extracted are the mandibular and maxillary first molars. So number three, number 14 number 19, and number 30. So for the sake of today's conversation, we're going to cover uh, those teeth, you know, upper and lower first molars. And um, we'll also we'll also discuss some options for premolars and anteriors as, as I put those in a, in a separate category. The, the molar sites, being the first molar, are typically the first tooth to erupt that has grooves, typically the first tooth to get decay, typically the first tooth to get crowned, typically the first tooth to get root canaled, retreated, had failures, and, and eventually need to come out. So, you know, there's always going to be that that lower first number 30 or that upper first number three that, for whatever reason, is non-restorable, patients in your office, and needing to take that tooth out. And then the conversation, you know, begins from there. Do we want to treatment plan and implant for this for this site in the future? And so that, determining that need before the tooth comes out is 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 great to do. So for the sake of this conversation, we're gonna we're gonna assume that 
that yes, the patient decides uh, and implants a future site, and because of its location, we're not going to temporize anything. We're just going to leave it blank and plan on a coming back and placing an implant when, once, once the site is healed. The next question becomes how to do a socket graft, present, you know, site preservation graft for these, for these areas. Um, you know, commonly these, these areas will have abscesses or, you know, buckle wall defects, uh, draining fistulas. Uh, they may be uh, failed root canals is typically what you see. And so there may be some level of um, ankylosis or fusion of, of, of the PDL to the, to the bone, to the tooth or, or, or disappearance of the PDL. So, you know, I'm always looking at my mind and thinking, okay, these are probably good surgical extraction candidates kind of planning ahead that way. How am I going to extract the tooth also determines, you know, how we might do the socket preservation graft. In my office, every tooth that I pull, I have a, a CBCT uh, comb beam. So I uh, take a comb beam of all these patients. I take a PA x-ray and a bite wing and, and determine, you know, how much structure is left, what anatomical contours or challenges am I dealing with, what, what types of uh, periapical lesions are, are there? What, what sort of pathologies under the tooth? You know, if, if there's major abscesses, if there's antibiotics that need to be uh, done before the surgery, you know, are there, are there undercuts? What type of bone I might need to be removing? Uh, you know, what sort of challenges I may have with that location of the inferior alveolar nerve, location of the sinuses. These are all things that I want to determine ahead of time so that I can have that kind of game plan in mind before going into, you know, discussing the patient. Okay, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to split this tooth. We're going to take it out in pieces. You know, it may have some undercuts. It, it may need some torque. We may need to remove bone. We may need to dig out a cyst, you know, it, he, telling the patient ahead of time so that we can reduce all complications in the chair and, and setting expectations with the patient. So I go ahead and make all those, uh, provisions and, uh, and, um, you know, preparations for uh, instruments and, and, and setting the patient's expectations. So the day of the surgery, I will bring the patient in and do a mouth rinse with Paradex before the procedure. And if there are, you know, if it's an upper uh, number three, I may infiltrate with uh, Articane. And uh, if, if it's a lower, I may uh, do an inferior alveolar block with a lidocaine and then maybe a buccal infiltration with Articane also. And then I like to use the uh, Ligajet for infiltration anesthetic uh, on the buccal papillas and then punch through on the lingual papillas and then and then numb the whole lingual side with that so I don't have to uh, do a, uh, a block on uh, the roof of the mouth. I don't have to do a puncture to the, uh, the roof of the mouth there. Um, nobody likes getting a, a shot to the, to the roof of the mouth, so I try to reduce any pain I can that way. I also might um, do an interligament squeeze of anesthetic into the uh, tooth ligament that way for extra anesthetic. Also thinking about if there is an abscessed lingual tooth root on number three, sometimes you need more anesthetic infiltrated on the lingual. So sometimes that's, that's an extra area of sensitivity. So that's definitely an area to add extra anesthetic while, while numbing your patient. Once the patient is numb, more times than not now, um, I am sectioning teeth as I find it easier to get the teeth out. I find it less traumatic on the patient, and I'm fine that I'm able to take the, take the teeth out quicker that way. The, the way that you're going to reduce inflammation, post-op pain, and inflammatory responses is to, is to get the tooth out as quickly as possible and as clean as possible. So with sectioning, what I like to do is split a maxillary tooth. You start at the mesial marginal ridge and go right down the middle of the tooth to the distal marginal ridge. And split it all the way down to the all the way down to where the the tooth roots split. So all the way down to the frication, and then right in the middle of, uh, between the mesial and buccal, I will then split the mesial and and buccal roots, the mesial buccal and the distal buccal roots. So it's almost like I'm making the letter T on the upper first molar, and on the lower first molar, obviously there there's a mesial buccal, mesial lingual, and a distal root. So I like to split the tooth going from the lingual to the palatal. So, so cutting, in, cutting the tooth in half that way. So there's a there's the front half and a back half. What this allows me to do is then split those teeth with a, with, with a, with a carbide or, or a diamond. Really, it really doesn't matter, uh, you know, as long as, it's, as long as it's cutting clean and cutting fast. And what, what I do is, is split the tooth all the way down to the furcation. 
and then I get my uh, small or large elevator, whichever one I can get in those cracks, and I will start to crack the tooth in, into the, the lower tooth and a half and the upper tooth and a third. So you want to section the, the lower number 30 into a into two mes you know to a mesial half and a distal half, and then you split the upper tooth into a palatal, mesial buckle, and distal buckle roots. Once I achieve that split, at this point, I continue with the small elevator, and I, can, I then elevate the root tips out one by one, and depending whether or not I need forceps or not, then I, you can grab the pieces and rotate those out like an anterior tooth. You can spin them, and they just rotate right out. So this makes the process quite simple, makes it very atraumatic for the patient as you're not having to put them in a headlock and torque on their head as much. Uh, makes it very, very fast and efficient extraction so that there's not much inflammation and um, trauma to the, to the gum tissue. So I, I find this to be the, the best way to do it. And then if there's any undercutting that needs to be done of the bone, you can obviously carve out that undercut so that a, a root tip might slip out if it's blocked out, uh, you know, undercuts. Or, or if there's a, you know, a, a bend in the root, you can dig down and chip that out or, or get your root tip picks in there and, and flick out those tips. So. Once the teeth are out, I then determine, you know, how much curatage of that bone needs to be done. Uh, you want to scrape out all the remaining PDL ligaments. You want to scrape out all the infected abscess tissue. You want to get down to good, healthy bone. You want that bone to be clean and white, and you want active bleeding to occur. That is a, a good, healthy process. You know, a bleeding bone is, is a good bone, so you want to see that white, porous bone, and you want it to bleed, and you want to get all the abscess and, and extra extra tissue, all the granulation tissue cleaned out of there. At this point, I have a good healthy socket, which, which may or may not have a buckle or lingual defect, depending on if there was abscess and drainage from the infection. At this point, I like to, you know, get my bone material opened up and hydrated. Now, when it comes to bone material, there are lots of different bone materials out there. And so what I like to use in my practice right now is I'm using direct gin which is a mineralized cortical cancellous blend. It's an aloe graft. It comes in sizes 250 to 1,000 microns. And um, what it is, is it's a bone material that's from uh, cadaver bone. And it's mineralized, so it gives a scaffolding for the bone um, in the regenerative process to use those minerals. It has cortical bone, cancellous bone mix, 50-50. And it has different sizes of particles. So it has some big particles, some small particles, and it creates a nice layer for that bone to be filled in. Um, and what I like about this is, is it serves as a, a nice filler that you can compact into that site with, the, uh, with a bone packer or, or an amalgam packer. And you can, you, I like to scoop it up and pack it in the bone site. What I want to do is, is, is pack that bone in there until it is, um, it is flush and it is healed uh, or until it is flush and level with where the tooth was so, and, and, and where the, um, you know, the, the, the top of the socket. So I want to fill that completely. And each time you put in a little bit of that bone, I want to pack it down firmly. You don't want to overpack, but you do want to pack firmly. You don't want pockets in there. So I fill that up. I fill the void or the defect completely. And then pack that in. And so next, if this is a posterior tooth, number three or number thirty, you know, I like to use non-resorbable membranes. The 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 goal to try to, to try to close that socket site with with primary closure is not going to be possible. You're not going to be able to pull the tissue tight enough. It, it's a big void. So I like to use membranes uh, to to cover the graft site to make sure that the bone graft stays in place. And the purpose of that membrane is to keep the bone in, keep the uh, integrity of the bone in the socket, and to allow the, the gum tissue to grow over that on top and not let the epithelial tissue sink in and, and destroy the integrity of that bone so that you get nice bone growth in the socket, you get epithelial tissue closing over, and then you're, you're creating a nice bone volume for future implant. So the non-resorbable membranes I like to use are the cytoplast. TXT 200 singles. They are 12 by 24 millimeters. They come 10 in a box and they're roughly, uh, I think $400. So they, they come out to about 40 a piece. So it, um, 
it doesn't allow the bone to spill out. It doesn't allow the bone to get infected. It keeps out bacteria and it keeps out the epithelial tissue and they're pretty rigid. So they keep that, um, that bone graft in place. So what I like to do in placing those is take your molt number nine or, or a Woodson elevator and, and, and elevate the retract the, the, on the buckle and the facial bone, separate the, um, the gingiva off the bone. So you want to get it completely off the bone and you want to you want to go halfway down the buccal and lingual ridge. Now, if, if if there's a big defect, you may want to take a number 15 scalpel blade and do a uh, kind of a, a releasing flap uh, to open up and really visualize this more. But if this is a straightforward process with with no with no buccal or lingual defects, you can just open that up and and push their molt you know five or six millimeters down on each side and separate between the bone. And the attached gingiva. You want to take the the membrane has a smooth side and a side with little dimples in the top. The dimples face out, so towards the, towards the mouth. So the flat side lays on top of the bone, and you lay that flat on top of your bone graft, and then it lays horizontally, and you tuck in about four or five millimeters of the flap under the lingual side, and then lay it over the bone graft, and tuck four or five millimeters of the flap on the buccal side uh, under the 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 gingiva as well. So that when you're done, it the the membrane goes from five millimeters down the buccal plate up over the top of the crest of the ridge, and then down four or five millimeters on the lingual side, tucked underneath the keratinized epithelium tissue, you know the the the, the gingiva, the attached gingiva there, and then now you are ready to to do your suturing. So you know. Some people, um, you know, depending on the, the size, if there's two or three sites in a row, they do make a, a bigger membrane, but you can just use, you know, multiples of these. And, um, you know, this is the, the, um, this is the membrane of choice that I use for all my molars and, um, and even half of my premolars because it, it's very rigid. It holds the bone in place and, and it stays for, for the duration we want. So this is a, a great membrane to check out. And then after this point, you are ready to do your suturing. So um, what I like to do for suturing in these type of areas is I like to use a I like to use a PGA, which is a polyglycol polyglycolic acid. It's a synthetic absorbable. And for this, I like to use a, a 4.0 uh, reverse cutting um, C3 needle, which is just I think the uh, the size of the needle and what what this you know what what the goal for the for the suturing is is we're not going to get primary closure and we're not going to try what we're going to try to do is keep the uh, keep the keep the wings and keep the flaps of the uh, the gum tissue which was on the buccal and lingual surfaces that tooth we just want to keep that in place and we want to keep that that membrane tarp closed down so what I'm doing with mine now is I'm I'm putting uh, two uh, interrupted mattress sutures in so I will start on the buckle and put. Um, I, I'll go through the buccal gingiva, go across over the top of, of the membrane, go through the lingual gingiva, uh, come back through the lingual. I'll, I'll move over about three, cent, three millimeters, come back through the uh, lingual gingiva, and then come back over to the buccal uh, gingiva again, three or four millimeters over from the first place in parallel with the second, and come back through that again, and then tie an interrupted knot. And what that does is, is it pulls the pressure, but it doesn't put the tension on. Um, you, you you can tighten that down a little bit, and it doesn't put the tension on on the occlusal table of that um, extraction site. It puts the tension on the buckle, and it keeps the uh, the tie of the um, suture on the, keeps the tie of the suture on the buckle too, so the patient's tongue isn't dealing with it, and it's not on top of the graft collecting food and bacteria. So I'll put one of those um, maybe near one gingiva um, papilla on the mesial and then one kind of close to the to the back gingiva papilla on the distal and those those two interrupted mattress sutures uh is generally enough you you can put you know a, a third <coughs> you can put a third interrupted suture right over the top um if you felt like it needed more stability and so that is the type of sutures that i like to use on that and i usually find that those those two or three is enough for that process and like I said, you don't want to make them too tight. The goal isn't to close that um, tissue. The goal is just to keep the, the the flaps down, the papillas down, keep the keep the membrane in place. So you're not going to close um, that hole. You're you're basically going to leave the the gingival right where it was, right after you extracted the tooth, and you're going to let the gum tissue on the on the 
the buccal and the lingual granulate over and fill in over on top of that membrane. And so that you get, you're, you're, you're creating a nice big volume of attached gingiva now, which is also very important. Um, when you come back and place your implant, you're going to want all that attached gingiva. So we're not going to try to pull the tissue tight. We're not going to stretch the tissue. We're not going to put tension there. We're going to let it all granulate in and fill over. And so that's going to create a nice, healthy, bulky ridge of healed bone attached gingiva. So that is the end result and end goal that we're going for. So after this procedure, I generally, if, if the patient had an abscess tooth or a cyst underneath the infection area, I will put the patient on some antibiotics, usually five to seven days worth of either some amoxicillin or some clindamycin or, um, you know, something in that family, depending uh, if they have allergies to amoxicillin or not. And then I will also put the patient on a Paradex mouth rinse. I'll have the patient do two rinses a day, swish and spit for the first week uh, until they come back and see me at their one week follow-up. So uh, I typically am now doing injection steroid shots infiltrated on the buckle of dexamethasone. And you can listen to that episode in the pharmacology uh, podcast that I did for, for details about that. But I am also injecting some steroid up in the cheek to help reduce inflammation as that's generally the biggest cause of pain. So the patient will leave my office potentially with a script for antibiotics if there was a big abscess they will they will always leave with paradex and typically some pain medicine too like some norco or some tylenol 3 for discomfort although i tell them ibuprofen is 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 what they should start out with when the patient leaves they are scheduled to make a one week follow up with my office i like to do a one week follow up and the patients to be either taking their antibiotics absolutely going to be doing their paradex rinse twice a day swish and spit and pain medicine, pain medicine is necessary. Now, with that one week follow up, I'm looking for is my membrane still in place? Is the extracted and grafted area does it look infection free? Uh, are are there any um, signs of inflammation? Are my sutures still there? And, and and is everything starting to heal? And so, what you're going to see is is hopefully still that that top side of the membrane. Hopefully, some of the the the, the swelling or, or inflammation has gone down and. And, you know, you can tell usually by then if the patient's been using the Paradex rinse because there's just a little bit of stain on the tooth. So, if, or, you know, around the other teeth. If there's not any signs of infection or inflammation, I can sometimes take down the, the Paradex rinse to one time a day um, as, as twice a day can really stain the teeth and patients complain about the taste. So we can take um, the patients down to one time a day if they like or, or, or if there's a high risk factor, still keep them at twice a day. And I tell patients at this point, you know, they can eat and drink and brush and floss normally. The only thing, you know, just if it hurts, don't do it. If it doesn't hurt, you're good to go. And then I want to see the patients back three weeks after that. So my first follow-up visit is one week after the extractions. Um, the second follow-up visit is four weeks after the extractions and bone graft placement. So I'm leaving the sutures in. I'm leaving the um, membrane in. The sutures are removable, but I'm still leaving them in. Those typically resorbs in 21 to 28 days. So sometimes when they come back for the last visit, the sutures are in. Sometimes they're not, but the membrane is always in place. So when the patients come back in at their four-week visit, I'm taking another follow-up x-ray. Um, I forgot to say earlier, I take a follow-up x-ray the day of to make sure the bone graft's in there, the membrane's in there, and everything's fine. The tooth roots are out, the infection's gone, and we've packed the bone adequately. I'm taking another follow-up x-ray at the four week to make sure the bones filling in the infections are gone all those things look good at this point i clip the sutures if they're there if the sutures aren't there that's fine the membrane usually has some kind of yellow crusty looking things on top of it at this point that's not a big deal 90 percent of the time i do not have to numb the patient and if the patient is sensitive typically a strong topical will work the goals for the this day are to take out the um, cytoplast TXT 200 non-resorbable membrane. Typically, all I find that I have to do is get a pair of cotton forcep pliers, grab the membrane, and kind of tease it out. You do have to work at it a little bit. But it, it has attached in there pretty good, and you're kind of teasing that out. Now, when you take it out, you know, you're going to be wondering what you're going to see under there, and, and, and what you'll see is you'll see some granulation tissue on top of that bone. Now, I don't know if that's true epithelial tissue, but it's definitely granulation tissue, and it's turning into um, you know, epithelial tissue and people ask, well, how does, how does that get underneath the membrane? If you have the membrane on top, you know, I don't have a good answer for that. I'm not, a, I'm not a scientific dentist. I'm, I'm a clinical dentist, but what I know is usually hundred percent of your bone volume that you've placed in there is there. 
the entire space is filled in with bone and there's some granulation tissue on top. It'll be kind of red. It may bleed just a little bit. Typically you blot dry with some cotton and it's good to go. Now it still looks somewhat immature and is still sensitive. So I tell the patients, you know, still continue to be kind of easy with it over there. If there's signs of, um, well, it, it actually looks like, it looks like the tissue when you take out a baby tooth and there's that little granulation tissue underneath that baby tooth and it's kind of red and it kind of bleeds a little bit, but it doesn't bleed a lot because there's not much under there. That's exactly what it looks like. So that's what you should expect to see underneath that membrane. If everything looks good, I tell them they can be done with the Paradex, brush and rinse like normal. I want to see them back in typically eight weeks now. So um, what I want to do is start getting ready for my implant. I want to see them back in eight weeks for implant, the beginning of the implant treatment planning. So they'll come back in eight weeks. The tissue will be fully healed over, full keratinization. The, the gingiva looks you know, strong and healthy and puffy and pink. There's a nice flat, wide ridge there. There is healthy bone filled in. That is when I take my CBCT um, comb beam scan and do my impressions to make my surgical guides. Since every implant I use, I, I at least make a pilot guide that um, gives me my angulation and my pitch. So I, I will get my impressions. At that point, I get new x-rays. I get everything needed to start my implant treatment planning process because at that point, I'm 12 weeks in and 95% of the bone has integrated and turned over and the, the gum tissue is healthy and pink and, and strong, and so we're ready to go. So that's the kind of process and um, walkthrough that I use for a number three, a number 14, a number 19, a number 30. You know, those are, you know, first and second molars basically are, are the same, but I don't always, you know, replace second molars with implants, but, you know, half the time we do. So that's the process with those. Now, I could say that even up to the, you know, the first and second premolars, you can basically use that exact same process if you'd like. The difference is um, with the Cytoplast TXT200 membranes, you will have to do some trimming because you don't want the membrane, when you put it in, you want it about the exact width in between the teeth and to, to fit in between the, uh, the gingiva. You don't want it to come up over the gingiva. You don't want it to touch the teeth. You really want it to lie flush. So you'll have to, to hold it up near the tooth and maybe trim it with some scissors and um, you know, get it a, approximately um, cut cut the way you want. You, you may have to cut it slightly like an hourglass shape to fit in between the teeth, but then still have some wide um, buccal and lingual um, wings on it to, to tuck down. So, you know, it's it, it's a bit more hourglass shape that you cut with your scissors. And so a little trimming with those, but typically with the first molars, I don't do any trimming. It's it's made for those sites. So those, those processes can basically be translated up to the premolars with a little more trimming and uh, scaling of that. Now, some people, you know, don't do any tissue retraction or any flaps when they extract teeth. Some people like to flap and see everything. For me, if I take x-rays and CT scans and there's no defects, nothing, I, I generally just pull the teeth, use my molt number nine, push the gums away, tuck in my membrane and go. If there are big defects, what I like to do is get my 15 blade and do some sort of flap where I'm, I'm doing one tooth behind, one tooth uh, ahead, and, and making a, a flap for, um, you know, adequate vi visualization. So, you know, what, what you want to do with, with those kind of flaps is you want to make sure you're, you're cutting all the way down to the bone. You want a full tissue thickness flap. Um, you want to always have the base wider um, than the part of the, um, the neck of the tooth. And that is for proper um, uh, blood flow and proper, um, you know, the, the, the tissue gets its um, blood supply from the periosteum. So you don't, you don't want to, uh, you don't want to cut off its blood supply. You don't, you definitely don't want to cut up towards the um, um, aesthetic zone. So, so usually an envelope flap is just fine. And if you do need to do vertical releasing, just try to stay away from the uh, aesthetic zone and, and make sure you're not tearing. So. You know, definitely, definitely go one or two teeth in front, do an envelope flap, visualize that way. You can always um, go, go further apically up in, in for releasing. Um, but if you do have to do a vertical releasing incision, try to do it uh, on the distal away from the um, aesthetic zone. And then you can visualize better, if, you know, and, and, may, and maybe, maybe place the, uh, the membrane higher up. Uh, where where the defect is, or or potentially even place two membranes in there if need be. Um, I, I found that I've had to do that before, and that's fine as long as you can 
um, get in to retrieve it later and you know how many put in and you're always getting them out later or sometimes you can do a uh, resorbable one membrane in there too so the only difference with some of the premolars and anterior teeth so let's let's change gears and say you know what if the tooth is small what if we're in the anterior do, do you still use the non-resorbable do you still use the cytoplast if we're getting near the canine or the anterior teeth what i like to do is use a resorbable membrane those um you can uh th those are typically collagen membranes you know some of them are, are resorbable in six to eight weeks some of them are longer you know up to even six months so it really depends what your what your um what your goals are but for for a true socket graft um with, with no buckle facial plate breakage and or, or no tinting grafting that we're going to do typically the, the the short resorbable um you know three to six months what will do just fine they're they're typically made out of like a type one collagen sometimes they're harvested from um from pigs sometimes they're harvested from bone and um i don't know that that matters you, you know you really just want to look at you know sometimes uh your price point sometimes the sizes um you know do you want you want some flexibility but you want some cross linking for strength and all that so right now i'm using the the contour um sustained resorbable collagen membrane that's contour with a k k o n t o u r that's also from um implant direct so i'm buying the direct gen the contour and the cytoplast um tx t 200 all from implant direct i find that their uh, products are good they have a great price point and um you know ordering is easy so you know the whole the whole process just makes it easy to get everything there and and, and they have a good system for that so the contour membranes you know um you would definitely trim those to size let's say we're taking out a number seven um for future implant placement or number nine for future implant placement I would still take the tooth out as atraumatically as possible. I usually don't split those, but that's where, um, you know, periotomes or, you know, really working that PDL, um, making sure you're not breaking the buckle plate becomes extremely important. And then I would still take out the tooth, still clean out the socket, um, and then still pack it with bone, gra bone graft. Now, if you're doing an anterior tooth or a premolar, I would get a smaller size. So you would only need maybe, you know, half a cc. Whereas in the in the back teeth, you probably want one cc of bone. If it's a if it's a large defect or you have two teeth, you may want two cc. So for a typical molar, I buy one cc of bone. Uh, for a typical anterior premolar, I buy 0.5 cc. Now um, the price point isn't too much, so if you just want to have a bunch of one cc around, that'd be fine. But it's not something you can open up and repackage. So you know, open up the 0.5 cc. You know, uh, infiltrate with some sterile saline, hydrate it. You know, pack it in the anterior tooth the same as you would. You know, put it in incrementally, pack it down firm, not too hard. And then what I would do is place the resorbable collagen membrane the same way. You know, I would still make it maybe like a uh, oh an hourglass shape. You know, fit some over the buckle, fit some over the lingual. You know, uh, where you separate the uh, periosteum. And the the difference is though, I would try to release a little bit up the facial, release a little bit down the lingual, and I would try to get. Um, close to primary closure with my suturing because these type of membranes do better with with near or primary closure if, if possible. They're not as strong, they're not as durable. So um, generally, you can you can you can cinch those tight and, and close them up pretty close within a millimeter of closure, and, and that's generally enough. So a little bit different technique with those because you are trying to close that that gap um, with the resorbable collagen membrane, whereas the TX non-resorbable, you're just leaving that open area and just letting it fill in with this one with an anterior teeth with resorbable membranes. You are generally trying to get it as tight as possible. So, um, it just changes your releasing incisions or your suturing techniques. And in the anterior, I just do, sometimes I'll do, you know, just a couple, um, interrupted sutures in that and, and call it good. So there's, there's nothing fancy you need to do. You know, sometimes if if you're thinking, am I over suturing or under suturing? I, I would generally over suture, um, so that so that in case one or two fails or pops out or, or whatever, you you have more there. Um, as I feel that you know the main thing that's going to cause problems is your sutures coming out, your membranes coming out, and then your bones coming out. So it, it starts from the top. Over suture, you know, place the membrane appropriately, suture firmly, and uh, you know, pack the bones so. The last thing you want is the sutures coming out and the membrane comes out and the bone comes out and the patient comes back and there's a big hole there. They've got a dry socket and then you've got a void. It, it, it's much easier uh, 
to, to avoid these situations on, on the front end than maybe to repair on the back end. So that would be my recommendation on suturing is, is always spend a little bit extra time, put your sutures in correctly and, and over suture and you'll, you'll never be disappointed that you did. So sometimes I, I spend just as much time suturing as I did actually uh, taking the teeth out. So that's my advice on the, um, the suturing part. So if you're, if you're someone who absolutely doesn't believe in the um, resorbable um, sutures for whatever reason, I also keep uh, some uh, Cytosurge PFTE sutures from Salvin uh, in hand. And, and so um, those can be good to use maybe in the interior zone or if you're worried about um, infecting your graft or, or wicking uh, from some of the um, braided sutures and wicking bacteria. If you're if you're a real suture nut, then uh, the PFTE is um, a pretty popular suture, and those are non-resorbable. So you're you're going in and removing those. But I like to leave my sutures longer than um, than I do shorter. So typically three to three to four weeks is a good time for sutures because the last thing you want to do is take the sutures out too early and have your wound uh, dehisce and reopen and tear and spill out and and cause infection or loss of bone material so i tend to go a little longer with the with the suture time there so what i look for with this technique is it really puts me in position to take someone who's got an infected tooth get them healed get them ready for an implant and ready to go in three to four months and that three to four months is obviously dependent um, on how big the site was how much the infection was there how quick that person heals and uh you know other other health factors for the for the area. Um, you know there may maybe if they're if they're on diabetes or other healing issues, it may be four or five months. But if they're maybe a younger quick healer, it may be you know closer to that three to four month process. So yeah, these techniques can get you to have a nice, very full ridge and very healthy area. If you're using guided comb beam, you know definitely uh, definitely ready to go at that time. If you're not using guided comb beam. Um, you're going to have a big enough and wide enough ridge that you can probably just come back and put your hole right in the middle of where your wax up tooth would be and, and be just fine. So, but if you're not using CBCT, I would recommend you to, to visualize the bone and the undercuts and the anatomy when you're doing the extraction so that you know how to choose your angulation and pitch for implant placement when you come back. But, um, I, I would also strongly encourage people to use CBCT comb beam, um, technology when, when implant planning. So that's just my word of advice there. So if anybody has any questions about socket grafting, about the bone type to use, about what types of membranes to use, um, feel free to hit me up on um, the website. Feel free to hit me up on the, um, the Dental Implant Practices Facebook uh, page. It's a, it's a closed page to keep out promotions, but you can join, ask to join. I'll let you become a member, and you can see some of the examples I've done and posted there. And, and you can ask questions and we can talk that way or, you know, feel free to look me up on Dentaltown on KC Dental and see some of the examples I've posted there. So you guys can start your implant journey and start your um, start getting those 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 big fat wide ridges out there and get them ready to sink some uh, titanium in. So hope you enjoyed the show and hope to catch you back next time here soon. Go to uh, Dental Implant Practices. And check us out on the web and also go to our um, iTunes and, and leave us a nice review on iTunes. Hope you enjoyed the show. Thanks. Thanks.